Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan faced blows on two successive days as he was sentenced to 10 and 14 years in prison in separate cases. The first sentence was in what is called the Cypher case and the second was in the Tosha Khana case. The verdicts came days ahead of elections in Pakistan where his party, the PTI, has faced a major crackdown. What does this mean for Imran Khan and his political future and for Pakistan as a whole? We go to Abdul. Abdul, thanks for joining us. So maybe could you first take us through what these two cases are for which Imran Khan has been sentenced to 10 and 14 years in prison? Well, Prashant, on Wednesday, uh, Imran Khan, from former Prime Minister, and his foreign minister, Saab Mohammad Qureshi, were found guilty in uh, uh, kind of uh, making public a secret document, uh, which basically is known as Cypher case. Uh, basically, it is related to a secret cable which was sent by the then uh, Pakistan, Pakistani ambassador in the US uh, in which basically he details about how US officials are pressurizing, uh, basically want the removal of Imran Khan. Uh, this document became a public, became a public, uh, uh, public issue when Imran Khan was facing a no-confidence vote uh, during, uh, in April 2022. Uh, he basically claimed that this, basic, uh, this amounts to external interference in, uh, the, in Pakistan's uh, policy making and, and basically goes against the, uh, the independence of Pakistan. Um, the other case in which he was found guilty on Thursday, the next day, uh, is basically called, uh, is po popularly known as Tosha Khana case. It is, uh, he along with uh, his wife Bushra were found guilty by another court uh, uh, in kind of uh, illegally selling some of their state gifts. Um, and, and in both the case, uh, in this case, he was both he and Bushra Bibi were uh, sentenced for 14 years in prison. Um, they were also fined uh, around 2.5, 2.7 billion dollars uh, each and they were basically barred from holding public office for next 10 years by the court. Uh, in, in both of the cases, uh, of course, uh, there are claims made by Pakistan uh, Tehreek e Insaf, Imran Khan's party that uh, they have been uh, kind of, uh, these are mistrials and they will file an appeal against both the cases in the higher judiciary. Nevertheless, uh, meanwhile, it basically uh, uh, means that Imran Khan will remain inside jail and, uh, 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 and of course, there are more cases which are pending against him. Uh, this, uh, so, the sentencing on Wednesday and on Thursday basically has uh, adds to uh, one further uh, sentencing which he had got last year uh, in which he was uh, sentenced for three years uh, in jail again uh, related to illegally selling uh, some of their state gifts. Right, but what does this mean for his political future? There's also restrictions on his contesting for any political office as well. Well, uh, Prashant, uh, it is at this moment very difficult to talk about the uh, exact impact these sentence, uh, these convictions will have on Imran Khan's career, political career, uh, given the fact that both PTI and Imran Khan personally have decided, said, claimed that they are going to... Uh, uh, kind of appeal against the, uh, the case and given the procedural lapses they have highlighted, if they are true, uh, the higher judiciary is most likely going to stay uh, the verdict, uh, sorry, uh, going to stay the conviction and uh, I, in that case, uh, it is uh, uh, not sure, uh, though it, in that case, uh, it will all depend on what happens in the February 7th elections, I'm uh, sorry, February 8th elections, whether um, if uh, PTI supported candidates, of course, most of them are contesting independently, uh, if they are able to secure a majority in the Pakistani parliament, of course, anything can happen. If that does not happen, uh, it, it's more likely that uh, Imran Khan's uh, legal 
problems will continue given the fact that there are more than 100 cases, more than 100 cases against him uh, filed against, uh, uh, filed in different co courts in uh, different parts of the country. Uh, and uh, even if he secures bail or uh, gets uh, his uh, conviction suspended in these two cases, he may be, uh, may be arrested again uh, in another case. So it is not sure at this moment what will happen to Imran Khan. But uh, one thing is quite sure that these convictions uh, add to the general public perception in Pakistan about Imran Khan being persecuted by the uh, political class and the army and this may increase in fact his pol uh, popularity uh, across Pakistan. There are already indications of uh, uh, indications uh, through whatever surveys which have been conducted so far that he is the most popular uh, uh, figure for uh, uh, prime minister in the next uh, next time uh, uh, and, and if he, his, his party colleagues are able to secure majority in the Pakistani elections, national elections, not anything is possible. Uh, so, yeah, that is what. And finally, Abdul, could you take us through, you know, ele elections are just a few days away. What does this verdict mean for the elections and for his party? Uh, well, Prashant, uh, see, uh, as I said before, there is a very strong public perception about um, uh, Imran Khan being persecuted by the state by the political class and the army in Pakistan uh, for uh, uh, for standing against them, standing against the U.S. dictate dictates, uh, and uh, this pitch has been uh, used by PTI Pakistan Tariq Insaf Imran Khan's party uh, throughout these uh, last one and a half years. Uh, and they are also using it in the campaign which we are, they are taking on the ground uh, for February 8th elections uh, for both National Assembly and uh, state assemblies, uh, some of the state assemblies. Uh, so, uh, uh, given the perception, a strong perception, uh, these, these convictions basically strengthen that pu public perception and this may lead to further consolidation of popular vote in favor of PTI candidates. PTI candidates uh, are already campaigning with the, uh, uh, with basically claims that they are being persecuted uh, for standing with Imran Khan. They are also, uh, they are accusing the Pakistan Election Commission for kind of uh, denying them uh, level playing field. Uh, for example, the PTI as PTI's electoral symbol cricket bat was taken away. Imran Khan has been banned, uh, made ineligible for contesting in the elections. Uh, his nomination got cancelled um, uh, by the ECB. Um, then uh, uh, more, uh, basically has uh, kind of uh, led to a kind of new uh, kind of strategy which, mo which most of the uh, uh, PTI candidates have undertaken, which basically is to contest the elections in the, as independent candidates. And if they are able to take this campaign uh, effectively to the ground uh, and the people who believe that Imran Khan is persecuted uh, decide to come out and vote on February 8, uh, so this may lead to a, a kind of a PTI candidates get getting enough uh, seats in the parliament to kind of uh, decide uh, the fate of Imran Khan. Because since they are all contesting in the name of Imran Khan, uh, of course, once they are able to secure some kind of majority, they may uh, uh, try to kind of take him out of jail and make him prime minister. This is all, of course, a speculation given the fact that opposition uh, led by PPP and uh, Nawaz Sharif's party, Awami League, uh, is also talking about these convictions in the way that it proves their um, uh, their claims of Imran Khan being corrupt, inefficient, um, uh, and then it depends on how it works out on the election day. So uh, we should wait and watch what happens exactly on uh, February 8, uh, and it all depends on uh, the results of the election. 
Thanks so much, Abdul, for speaking to us. Protests by farmers across Europe have escalated with a huge mobilization taking place in Brussels on Wednesday. This follows agitations in countries like France and Germany. While media reports have cited an opposition to the Green Deal as a major reason, the picture is way more complicated and also has to do with a variety of EU policies. We go to Anna to understand more. Anna, thanks so much for joining us. Protests taking parts in, uh, place in various parts of Europe. Uh, today, one in Brazil, if I'm, Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, each of these has its own context. But maybe could you give us an overall picture of what's happening first? Uh, the protests have been going on for the past weeks uh, and essentially they covered most of Europe for now, especially those countries uh, which are uh, some of the biggest agricultural producers in the European Union. So it all started from Poland, we can say in a way, but by today uh, it has also spread out to France, to Germany, to Italy, to Spain um, and, and so on. So uh, what we are seeing are different struggles, of course, the farmers in different countries do have their specific requests. Uh, but we also know that it's uh, all part of uh, a more general uh, uproar against uh, a set of European uh, policies, or maybe it would be even better to say uh, the uh, the approach that the European Union has taken towards agriculture, uh, agriculture and farmers uh, in Europe. So uh, if you look at the news, uh, one of the things that is being singled out is that the farmers uh, are actually protesting against the European Green, uh, Green New Deal. Uh, so against the, the environmental policies, but I think that you know uh, it's um, it's a bit wrong to reduce it to that because uh, what we are seeing actually is farmers uh, on the road uh, blocking the ports, blocking the roads because the European Union and the members of the European Union uh, have disregarded their uh, their well-being and their their rights for uh, for the past uh, for the past years. Uh, we do know that uh, farmers, especially smaller farmers have had uh, very, very significant problems uh, with keeping up with uh, costs of production, uh, while at the same time they were getting less and less for the produce that they're putting on the market. Uh, of course, you know, in, uh, in the meantime, we do know that big agricultural businesses are profiting. They're benefiting from the subsidies that the European Union is providing. So uh, what we are seeing is, of course, uh, a very complex story. Uh, that uh, has a lot to do with how uh, food systems in Europe are, are structured right now uh, and about the importance that the small farmer uh, farmers uh, are given inside the system. Right, and in this context, you mentioned some of the EU policies, but that seems to be a larger structural thread, like you said, that you know connects many of these protests. So could you maybe go into a bit more detail about what are some of these policies? Well, um, one of the policies that uh, has been on top of the demands of the farmers is, of course, uh, part of the wider set of environmental policies, which would see that uh, they have to, uh, to uh, not use part of the land for uh, growing produce in order to conserve the land and to encourage biodiversity, uh, which is significant, of course, because, you know, uh, often when we talk about environmental policies in Europe, uh, we do touch, touch upon uh, the differences that uh, we have between the green policies that we, we know that we need to implement and the well-being of workers, in this case of farmers. So this is another thing that, you know, is showing how uh, how difficult these two things can be to, uh, to bring together. But what it also shows is that, you know, uh, while the European politicians uh, are quite vocal to say that, maybe not to say, but to present it as it's a black or white issue. So we either do one or we, we do the other. Uh, what basically is the truth that the, the policies that they are uh, suggesting uh, are not actually involving consultations with the workers, with the farmers directly. So they're not actually reflecting what's being demanded from the ground and what can be actually do, done on the ground. Uh, as in the case of many other industrial policies that we have seen raised in Europe over the past uh, past years when it comes to the environment, we do know that you know uh, there can be uh, a better way to approach transition. It can be a just transition. Workers can be supported with an adequate uh, dedication from right. the government to, to back that up. So now we are essentially witnessing something in the agricultural sector that we would otherwise expect also in other parts of the industry. Thank you so much, Anna, for the update. That's all we have in today's debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.